So since the beginning of summer, we've been working through the book of Exodus. And in this series, we are actually in this book, we're really seeing who God is. And at the very beginning of Exodus, we meet a guy named Moses and Moses's life was spared because the Pharaoh at that time wanted to wipe out all the firstborn male uh, uh, Israelites. And so his life is spared. He actually becomes one of the princes of Egypt. And about 30 years goes by and he witnesses a beating that's happening uh, of one of the Israelites. And he comes to his defense. He actually kills that soldier and, um, and then he, he's scared about that people are going to find out. And so he runs off into the desert. 30 years goes by after being a shepherd, he, he sees this bush that is on fire. And this bush is, is God speaking through it. And, and God says, you need to go back. You need to deliver my people out of Egypt. And, and after some convincing, and he sends his brother Aaron with him as well, they, they show up. And I can only imagine Moses thinking, okay, things are just going to happen. It's just going to be okay. I'm going to talk to uh, Pharaoh, the king, and he's just going to release the people. But that's not what happened. Over and over again, Pharaoh says, no, I'm not going to let them know. Let them go. No, I'm not going to let them go. And after plagues started happening, uh, he was like, okay, I'll let them go. And then he retracts. I'll let them go. And he retracts. And on the 10th plague, the very last plague, it, it, it's just crazy thing happened where all the firstborn males were wiped out. And so Pharaoh eventually said, you can just go. And so all the Israelites head on out and they, they get to this, this, this place called the Red Sea and they're up against the Red Sea. And all of a sudden the Egyptian king Pharaoh's like, no, I, I can't let them go. And so he now is chasing after them. And so everyone's wondering, what are we going to do? We're trapped between the Egyptians coming and the Red Sea. And God prepares a way. He, he parts the waters. They pass on dry ground to the other side. The Egyptians now go through the Red Sea, but the Red Sea collapses on top of them. A, a majesty, a majestic, excuse me, victory. And all of a sudden there's this like, uh, a musical that breaks out and they're singing praises to God. Now at that point you would think, okay, things are working, things are tracking, things are gonna be great, but that's not what happens. Shortly thereafter, there's this water source, but the water is bitter. They, they don't eat for three days. It's like all of these things just keep happening and happening and happening. And, and they're really relying on who God is, that God is trustworthy and he's good and he's praiseworthy and all of this stuff. And they're realizing these things about God. And then there's this army that comes and attacks them. Again, it's just one thing after another, but God is continuing to reveal himself. And so they end up to this place called Mount Sinai in chapter 19, and that's where we're going to hang out to hang out at today. Now, in Exodus 19 is a very important chapter, uh, not just because in Exodus 20 is when uh, uh, the Ten Commandments is revealed. A lot of us we understand or know about Exodus because of the Ten Commandments, but verse or chapter 19, excuse me, is extremely important. And and also even in the New Testament, they keep referring back to this moment. Where, where they see or where they feel God's presence. Now, Sinai is actually the same place where Moses got that revelation from God when he's in this burn, speaking through this burning bush. In Exodus chapter three, verse 12, just to kind of go back to it real quick, it says, he said, but I will be with you and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you, God says to Moses. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. The interesting thing here is where Egypt is and where the promised land is, is relatively close. Where Mount Sinai is, it's actually further away from the promised land than where Egypt is. But God wanted them to go there so that they can serve God on this mountain, so they can feel God, sense his presence. So after three months, Moses and three million people arrive to this dry, wilderness, desolate place. And Moses goes up on the mountain. And one thing you will see here in this chapter 19 is Moses goes up and down, up and down to this mountain to meet with God and then talk to the people, and then meet with God and then talk to the people 
over and over again. And as a city guy, this doesn't sound all that exciting, but as those of us that like to climb mountains and go on hikes, this seems awesome. But this is what Moses is doing up and down, up and down the mountain. So we're going to start in verse four of Exodus 19. This is what it says. God says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. God does this for the Israelites. He hears their cries in Egypt about the slavery and, and all the things that are going on that, that doesn't serve his people well. And he hears their cries and he saves them. He goes beyond what, what you would imagine he would do, but he saves them. He rescues them. He loves them with such compassion that he pulls them out of bondage. And, and God uses an interesting phrase here. He says, eagle's wings. Eagle's wings mean by sheer grace. Meaning there's nothing that, that the Israelites have done to earn this grace. It's not like they sacrificed enough. It's not like they were just good enough. They kept doing more good things than bad things. It had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with God's sheer grace that it was freely given. But through this gift he has for them, he wants them to respond and the first part of uh, verse five, it says, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, God wants him to respond because he has a blessing for them. He wants them to respond because they, there's a blessing that's for them. The interesting thing here is that God doesn't say, obey me, so I save you. He, he doesn't say that. He, he saves them first. And from that saving grace, they obey. And then there's blessing. In verses five, the end of verse five and verse six, it says, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And so, God tells Moses about these three blessings. The first is a treasured possession. Now, this is in reference to like in ancient kings, they have so much wealth and they have so much, in my mind, I think of like uh, the duck, at Looney Tunes or whatever, swims in, in like his gold. And it's like, they have all of this wealth, but a treasured possession is from that wealth they pull out and they place it on their mantle, the thing that they see or, or, or that they adore the most, or, or they put it in their secret room for just them to treasure. And that's the way that God sees them, that God delights in them this much that they are his treasured possession. The next thing we see is a kingdom of priests, a, a kingdom of priests meaning that they could go to God themselves. That's how he sees them or has this blessing for them that they can go to God themselves as well as bring people to God. That that's the way he sees this blessing for them. And lastly, I love this, a holy nation. A nation that, that is different than the rest of the world. A nation that is set apart. A nation that, that is about him and, and nothing else and nobody else. Now, verses seven and eight, Moses goes down the mountain and tells the people about all of this thing, all of these amazing things that God has for them and, and the blessings and, and, there are, and the elders and the people say, okay, we'll do this. And so he treks back up the mountain. In verse nine, it says, and the Lord said to Moses, when he goes back up the mountain, he says, behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you. And may also believe you forever when Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. When Moses to told the words of the people to the Lord, God is going to speak and everyone is going to hear. I can only imagine what his voice sounds like. And these unholy, unclean people will get a chance to experience his voice. 
but also because of this communication that's going to happen between God and Moses, is they're going to, God's really affirming who Moses is for all the people. And it says, believe you forever, like affirm you forever who you are. In verses 10 through 15, it talks about this preparation that's going to happen for these unholy, unclean people to meet God. It reminds me of, I have a 16 year old daughter and here in a couple of weeks is homecoming and her and her friends are gonna get together. They're gonna get all ready. They're gonna eat, they're gonna have fun, but they're also gonna get makeup on. They're gonna get their dresses on, take a ton of pictures before they meet their dates. Um, it, it even reminds me a little bit at 20 years old, I got married. It's crazy, but 20 years old, I got married. And my wife and I, Nicole and I, we didn't see each other until on, on our wedding day until the wedding ceremony. And, on, and during that day, we had a chance just to prepare each other, prepare ourselves to meet each other at the wedding. So we're with our friends and we're getting dolled up. Yes, I just said dolled up for a man, but we're getting dolled up and getting ready for preparing ourselves to see each other. And this is similar to what God is asking uh, Moses to tell the people to prepare to meet him. So in verse 10, starting verse 10 through 15, it says, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate, consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot, whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated, consecrated the people and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. Now there's a lot here in these five verses. And so let's kind of take this apart bit by bit. The first thing is this word consecrate them. So consecrate them. What does that mean? What does consecrate mean? It, it, it means according to this passage to dedicate yourself to service and worship, both physically and spiritually. It means to be set apart. It means to, to be set apart from everything else and everyone else to, to give priority. I love this, to give priority to spiritual things over physical things. It's intentionally avoiding things to hinder your connection with God, which sounds maybe harsh, maybe it's a little off-putting, but we do this in our life, don't we? Like when we wanna drop a few pounds, we decide, okay, I need to have a certain calorie intake and I can't exceed that calorie intake. So we decide not to have ice cream late at night or chocolate um, or, or whatever. Like we, we're like, okay, we can only be at this point. We also see this when maybe for us who have kids who are going into college or, or, or in that kind of right before that, that these students need to prepare themselves. So instead of staying out late with their high school friends, uh, that they're home studying for their SATs, that they're getting ready for this next step. We see this even at that. And maybe you're at the place of going, okay, not only do I want to watch how much I'm eating, but I want to exercise. So instead of like sitting in front of a TV or being on uh, social media or whatever, like we decide to go on a run or walk or go work out, lift weights. And, and so there's some things that we intentionally avoid. And so it's not so crazy, even spiritually speaking. A lot of us, like when we're really at this point of not knowing exactly what we should or should not do, and we're asking God, God, will you reveal it to me? A lot of us, we go on a fast. Maybe we fast a certain meal or for a certain day's amount of meals. Sometimes we do fast from social media or from entertainment to really hear what God wants for us in our life. 
for us young people in the room, um, when we're preparing ourselves for marriage. And so we're choosing not to make uh, some choices with our fleshly desires. And so we're intentionally avoiding some things. We are purposely avoiding it. And God is wanting his people to do the same things in preparation in meeting God. And he even says, so set limits. So set limits for the people. God is about to reveal himself, but he's saying you cannot go all the way up on the mountain. You can't climb to the top where Moses is at. So when I think of setting limits, I think of guardrails. I think of boundaries that's around the base of this mountain. And he's saying, do not go too close to the mountain. Don't even touch the edge of it because you are unholy and you are unclean. And, and he even says here, no hand shall touch it, but he shall be stoned or shot, that you will be stoned like rocks hurled at you or shot with an arrow. Can you only imagine you have like little kids and, and wouldn't you be scared, your anxiety through the roof, that your kids may get too close? And God's saying, set boundaries, set limits, put guardrails up. Then God commands purity. And he says this in verses 14 and 15, he says, wash their garments, and do not go near a woman. God is making sure they're making preparations in meeting him, not just physically, but also spiritually. Verse 15, when it says, do not go near a woman, refers to sexual relations. And part of preparations was to abstain from relations with your spouse. But it begs the question of why, why? The reality is, is that in Leviticus chapter 15, verse 18, there's this whole, actually Leviticus 15 talks a ton about rules and laws, but also what is unclean or what is unholy. And semen is considered unclean. Now God is making sure these unholy people can experience him. So he's saying, you need to do all of this to experience me. You have I'm going to be there in three days. So, so uh, all of your desires hold off. And it isn't that sex is a bad thing or even sinful. It's actually a blessing from God. But there are times when you need to abstain even beautiful blessings to encounter, to hear, and to experience what God has for you. So on the third day, he arrives. Verse 16, it says, On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. There's thunders, there's lightnings and a thick cloud. These were signs of his glory, of his power and of his majesty that he's there. The whole environment uh, um, spoke of his presence. The whole environment spoke of his presence, but also a trumpet blast. Now, the interesting thing is the trumpet blast did not come from the people, but it came from the mountain. It came from God himself, a trumpet blast. Because of all this, the people trembled. They trembled. Why? Why would they tremble? I think the reality is, is we don't know how far away, as far as who God is and who we really are, is like. God is just. He is holy. He is amazing. And we have no idea how de decrepitated, how sinful that we are to stand before a just, holy, pure, loving, and amazing God. All they could do was tremble. And at the sound of the trumpet, Moses knew what he was supposed to do. It says, then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled 
greatly. The whole mountain trembled greatly. The people could smell, they could hear, and they could feel because it says it trembled greatly. They could feel the holiness of God. In verse 19, it says that the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him in a thunder. Now the word thunder here is actually translated to coal, Q-O-L, which means voice or sound. And these people could hear God's voice and hear Moses talking to God. I wonder how beautiful that voice was, how lovely his sound was. You know, a lot of times in this series we're talking about, it, I hope that when we get to heaven, there's like this highlight reel. And this is the scene I want to see is Exodus 19, this, this conversation happening with God and Moses. My dad passed away about a year and a half ago. And people have asked me, what, is, what are some things or what's the one thing you miss most about your dad? And some of the things I miss, I miss just like chatting with him. Uh, he was a fisherman and he would tell me fisherman stories. I'm not much of a fisherman, but I know that's what he loved to do. And so I would go fishing with him and we just kind of sit and hang out. He wasn't much into sports, but he acted like he was so that we had something to connect about and he would know just enough so we could chat about it. Um, I loved the way that he connected with my kids but the one thing I miss the most of my father is his voice. I just miss his voice. I miss the sound of his voice. And so when my mom or my brother or anybody else has a video of my dad, I just want it because I get to hear the sound of his voice. The reality is it pales in comparison to God's voice though. This lovely, beautiful words can't describe God's voice is holy, holy, holy voice. And, and these unclean, unholy people were able to be exposed to God's beautiful voice. In verses 20 through 25, it goes on and says, the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went back up, up, down, up, down, up, down. And the Lord said to Moses, go back down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai for you yourself warned us saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you, but do not let the people, or do not let these priests, excuse me, and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Like there's those that were rebellious, or maybe curious, or the little kids, just making sure to set limits. But it kind of begs the question, what does this all mean? What does Exodus 19 mean? I believe it means this, that God is holy. That God is holy. Holy means to be set apart. It, it, it means to, to be uh, pure, perfect, transcendent. And in this context, I believe that it means, according to this passage, that Israel's moral imperfection to God's uh, uh, moral perfection. You see, Israel required a mediator, and his name was Moses, to go up and down, up and down the mountain. So, so they needed that person that they could do this. And what I love about this, this chapter is that people couldn't work their way up to God. They couldn't sacrifice enough. They couldn't even be like totally clean where they could go do and, and go up to the top of the mountain. They, they still had to stay only so far. And God knew that. So what God did is he came down, which is amazing 
and wonderful, but it doesn't end there. God didn't want the Israelites to stay in Mount Sinai. He wanted them to go to the promised land, a land that's flowing of milk and honey. And for you, the aim of God's work isn't for you to work your way up to God because you never will. You will never do enough good to outdo your wrong. You will never sacrifice enough to God to go, you know, I, I guess it's okay. That will never happen. You can't work your way up to God because it's God who came down to you. God knew that you couldn't do enough good. And he knew that you needed a mediator. And that mediator's name is Jesus. And through Jesus, through Jesus, you can be redeemed. Through Jesus, you can have a connection with God that you can't have any other way. And there's this amazing transaction that happens when you put your hope, trust, love, when you put your pure faith in who Jesus is. There's this trans, transaction that happens where he trades uh, your ugliness for his righteousness. In Hebrews chapter uh, nine, there's, there's, it kind of talks about like how Jesus is the mediator. And he says this in, in, in verse 15, the author of Hebrews says, therefore he, talking about Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. And because of Jesus and only because of Jesus in Christ, you are holy because of what he did but also what he continues to do for us, that he makes us holy. This only happens if you have your faith in Christ. You are holy. Um, a few months ago, we were working through the book of 1 Peter. And it's amazing how God just, you know, I was talking with the teacher team. It's amazing how God just works. We work through first Peter and now we're in this Exodus series and we have a new series that's coming up and it just seems like it's all connected. It's almost like God knows what he's doing. And in first Peter chapter two, Peter uses the same words characterizing the same themes that is talked about here in Exodus chapter 19. And I believe that one of the reasons why he wrote it that way is because the people that he's uh, writing to, these persecuted Christians, would have known this story. In chapter two, starting in verse nine, it says, but you, you who are um, Christ followers, you who have put your faith in Christ, but you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. In verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now you have received mercy. Peter is reminding these Christ followers that God is holy, but because of Jesus, so are they. And that is the gospel. And that gospel is the same truth as it was then as it is now. And when we look back at this series of Exodus that we walk through, we've seen who God is, that God is praiseworthy, that he's sovereign, that he's, that he's a provider, that he's freedom, that he's, he's purposeful and he is all of those things because he is holy. And he's been drawing people to himself and it didn't end 3,500 years ago. God is still drawing people to himself. And one of the beauties of this is because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. One thing I love is that when Jesus ascended up to heaven, he said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit will make his home in you. 
If you've crossed that line of faith, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You have God inside of you, making his home in you. And one of the cool things is here we go on is that we talked about First Peter and now we're in Exodus and now we're moving into a six-week series talking about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit makes his home in you. Hey guys, have a great week. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end right here. We're gonna have the campus pastors come up. Have a great week. See you guys soon. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out for just a couple more minutes. I wanna go through our transformational moment with you. Uh, the first thing is, how do you see God? How do you see God? Do you see him as praiseworthy, provider, um, purposeful? Do you see him as a leader? Do you, do you say, what else do I have? Do you see him as freedom, as sovereign? How do you see God? Now, maybe a little more introspective is this question is, is there a place where God's holiness cannot touch? For you, is there a place where God's holiness cannot touch? It's almost like, God, you can have the whole house except this one room, except this one place. You, you can't have that, but you can have everything else. Maybe it's, I'm working on this and then I'll give it to you as an offering, whatever it is. But like, are, what, is there a place where God's holiness can't touch? Because I think the reality is, is some of us may be on the base of the mountain. We're on the base of this mountain and God wants to, to give us all of him, but, but there's something we're unwilling to give up. Let's pray. God, I pray that uh, this, this series helps us to know more of who you are, helps us to know that you are good, that you're a provider, that you are a leader, that you are loving, that you are just, that you are holy, that you are all of these things. And in, in, in this specific chapter, in chapter 19, it really talks about how, how you are holy and also how uh, Moses is a mediator. And, and God, thank you so much for sending Jesus to be our mediator. And we can make this amazing trade that doesn't make sense, but this amazing trade that by your sheer grace you give just by your love, that we can trade our ugliness, our sinfulness for Christ's righteousness. So Jesus, I pray that that truth will captivate us and help us to open all rooms in our house to you. Thank you for your goodness and thank you for your love. In your name we pray, Jesus, amen. Guys, again, have a great week and we'll see you soon. Bye guys.